It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Brian Stiller this morning. Brian uh, began his lifelong journey to this place uh, many decades ago uh, on the prairies of Saskatchewan in Canada. Um, he grew up for a while, and then once he was grown up, he got into uh, youth ministry, and he did that for a couple of decades, eventually becoming the president of Youth for Christ in Canada. Uh, after that, he got involved with the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada and led that organization for a couple of years, traveling all around. Uh, finally, after, uh, after that time, he became president of uh, Tyndale in uh, Toronto um, and, and was president there for a couple of decades. There's too many decades in here, but okay. <laughs> so a couple of decades. And about four years ago, Brian took on the post of uh, the World Evangelical Alliance Global Ambassador. And it's really in the last several years as he's traveled all over the world that he's going to bring a richness uh, of uh, experience to us today. Uh, Brian has a wife, Lily, two children, and five gra grandchildren. Brian, would you come and speak to us? Thank you, Todd, and delighted to be here. <clears throat> I'd forgotten how beautiful this chapel was, uh, President. It's a, uh, I spent some time here a few years ago and had a great, great moment here at Gordon-Conwell. And to be here with you today in this special week of missions, uh, you never know what nudge you will get in these moments, as we were reminded yesterday. There are three global Christian communities. The Vatican, the Roman Catholic Church, about 1.2 billion. Uh, the World Council of Churches, which includes the Eastern Orthodox, it's about 500 million. And the World Evangelical Alliance, it's about 600 million. And so I serve this body called the World Evangelical Alliance. It was formed back in the mid-1800s and has been a voice for evangelicals around the world. There are, there are 129, uh, I'm dyslexic, 129 uh, national alliances like the National Association of Evangelicals here in the US, and those are scattered around the world, and my role is to travel and meet with our leadership, encourage, cross-connect with the World Council and the Vatican and the UN, and, and providing a global voice for evangelicals. It's a, it's a wide group. It's mixed with uh, all kinds of wonderful and oddball people. And it's within that group that I have this opportunity of serving. This morning, I'd like to talk to you about some of the major trends that I see moving about as I see the activity of the Spirit within the church. Now, as I work my way through these, I'm going to ask you to think back to Acts 10, where the Spirit nudges two people, one insider, one outsider. Peter, who is basically a racist, as we find as we hear him chat when he gets down to Cornelius' house, but by way of vision, he is lifted out of his racial bias to open his heart to a Gentile. But just down the road, there is this Roman centurion who is nudged by the Spirit, again by way of dream, and the two of them connect. I'd like you to think about where and how the Spirit is nudging you as we think about the world. And at the end of, the, of, of our time together, I'm going to tell you a story and I'm going to go back and ask you that question as we thought about these major trends, and there could be more, there could be less, but as we think about trends, the activity of Christ within the church today, where did you sense the Spirit nudging you this morning? There are many trends that we could talk about. Uh, what I would call environmental trends. Today we have refugees. We have the internet. Uh, postmodernism within our culture and within our intellectual worlds. You have global tensions. Uh, you have an economic rise and fall. You have a variety of factors that influence us from the outside. 
But I'm interested in looking at what are the internal drivers that are moving from the center of the church and working its way out. And there are a number, and Todd and I have talked about them, but let me suggest five that will help us focus on some areas in which the Spirit is working in particular ways this decade and these decades. I was born in 1942. So I was born the year that the NAE in the U.S. was formed. So my life kind of overlays the activity of the last, well, 74 years. I was born in a Pentecostal minister's home. I was born very young. <laughs> oh, gee. You're, you're bright. You, you woke up. Good. Went to the University of Toronto. Then did my graduate work in an Anglican seminary. And then ended up doing my uh, doctoral work here. So I cross many, many rivers and plains of religious life. But as I meet, and as I see, and as I observe, these are the five things that have really caught my attention. The first, of course, it's an age of faith. Now, if, if you read your journals or watch your television in North America or in Europe, it's not what you would expect to be, because it seems, and many of the polls suggest, a diminishing of faith within our North American European worlds. But globally, as your center of global Christianity can tell you, there's been an explosion of faith worldwide. The global south, as we call it, Africa, Latin America, Asia. And you have an activity of the spirit that is bringing people to faith in unbelievable numbers. But there are places where, places that are obscure, that we don't go into, that we don't hear much about, where faith is being diminished, where we're, for example, Iraq. Uh, Christian, yeah, Christian, the Christians are, being, are, are leaving by the thousands. And yet a few weeks ago I was in, in Kurdistan in the northeast province with 200 young people uh, between the ages of, say, 17 and 30. And for three days, we had this Bible prayer conference. Uh, bright, well-educated, alive, on fire for Christ, young people. Now, this was run by Presbyterians. Now, I know a little bit about Pentecostals. Eh. And I know they're after services. And they can go on for a long time. But I tell you, these Presbyterians put us Pentecostals to shame. Their vision and heart and their zeal for prayer and witness there in that world that we think is being stripped of any Christian witness. Nepal. Back a few years ago, there was known to be 100 Christians. Today, there's 1.4 million. I sat with a professor and I said, why this rapid growth? Well, he said, it's self-evident. I said, tell me. He said, when you're, when, you're in the, when you're in the mountains and your child is dying, and you're a day and a half walk away from a clinic, and someone tells you of someone who believes in prayer, and they come in and pray, and your child is healed. He said, it's amazing how that message ripples its way through the village. And they're in a Hindu country where there seems to be a prevalence of demonic activity, and where it's commonly known that so-and-so is... is, is is demonized and someone comes and prays and that person is delivered and they are restored to their family and, and if it's a father or mother and they're, they're able to parent again, he said it's absolutely stunning what happens in the whole community. And then you had soldiers recruited from Nepal by the British. When they came back, many had come to Christ and so when they came back to Nepal, they started churches. When the king finally allowed students to go overseas to study, they would come back and they too had found Christ and they started churches. It's remarkable. I was in Mongolia just a few days ago. In 1990, there was, they weren't sure whether there were four or five Christians. Today, there's 55,000. And as soon as the Soviet empire came apart and the doors were opened, uh, mainly Koreans went in. But today, there is a dynamic young church. 
Everywhere in the world I go, there is a growth and there is a witness. I was in Egypt just after the 21 Egyptians had been, had been decapitated in Libya. And the mothers of the, of the young men went on, on television and, and forgave those who had decapitated their sons. And the Egyptians were stunned. Young people who, th who thought that they saw a continuity of their faith towards ISIS and this violence, they, all of a sudden they were open to matters of faith. Uh, I had pastors saying, we're having Muslims show up at our, at our churches that before would be embarrassed or afraid to even show themselves into our churches. There's a shaking, there is a rattling going on. And it's the age of the explosion of faith in the places we least expect it. And of course, in the places that we see massive movements in, in Africa and Latin America and Asia. But it's also an age of the spirit. It's interesting when you look at church history up until the beginning of the 20th century, uh, our theology was, was, uh, was pretty shallow when it came to matters of pneumatology. All we knew of the Father, uh, our theology of the Father was very well grounded in the Old Testament and it's worked its way out in the, uh, in the documents of the, of, 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 the, of the early church. And of course, we knew Jesus. I mean, we've got, we've got four portraits of him. You've even got some pictures of them. So, come on. <laughs> so Jesus is well known to us. But the spirit, only occasionally was there a rise of spirit sensitivity. Maybe with a desert father or the Waldensians. And, and finally in the latter part of the 19th century in Wales and India and then here in, in America in, in the early 1900s. You know, there's this breakout of Pentecostalism where there is an interest in the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit of God. And now, this Pentecostal movement was dynamic, it became worldwide, but it became very divisive. Because at the heart of the Pentecostal doctrine and, and movement was this linkage of being filled with the Spirit and speaking in tongues. And of course, that created enormous cleavage within the evangelical Protestant world. And then you have cessationists, those who taught, and this was some of the main theologians taught this, that, that, the, that the gifts of the Spirit ended with the formation of the canon, the end of the apostolic age. And so you have this breaking out of the Spirit, but then you have this deep division that's causing, and I, and I was, well, I was, so I was born in 42, and I, I loved to go to Youth for Christ rallies as a kid. But I knew what people thought of me as a Pentecostal. I was kind of that spiritual rump, uh, to use a very sophisticated uh, metaphor. <laughs> but then something happened, and it started in the Episcopalian church. It's amazing how God can use Episcopalians now and then, isn't it? I'm always astounded. <laughs> and the charismatic movement bro breaks out. And, uh, and what the charismatic movement does, it says, the gifts have not ended. So they said, cessationists, you're wrong. The gifts are still active. They're still operative. And Pentecostals, you're wrong. Tongues is a wonderful gift. But don't equate the filling of the Spirit with that. And when, when they opened those doors, the Spirit rushed in and it transformed the world. It transformed the church. Uh... A few months ago, I'm name dropping, but for, for a reason. Uh, we had a three hour meeting with the Pope, three of us from the WEA. We had a one hour get to know each other session, then we had a two hour lunch sitting in a cafeteria talking about everything. And we could talk easily because we had a connection through the Spirit. Because he too understood by his, uh, by his Latin American experience the activity of the Spirit and the importance of the Spirit in the witness of the gospel and the bringing together of those who give name of Jesus as whom they follow. It happens everywhere. But what the Spirit, this new age of the Spirit has done, it has brought to the body of Christ, the laity, if you like, 
It's brought to us all an understanding that we too are temples of the Spirit. And wherever we go, He goes. Now that's, that's elementary theology to those of you here at Gordon-Conwell. But think, of, think about the ramifications of that very simple, profound theological construct. That wherever I go, God goes because God is in me by his spirit. It ennobles my task. So whatever I'm doing, this is a sacred space. It's a sacred calling. I am somebody, not in some kind of psychological 1970, 1980, I'm, I'm okay, you're okay stuff. But in true biblical imago Dei, God in us, we in his image, and he wanting to work through us. And what it's done is proliferated, and that's a good word, all kinds of ministries through the world. And so the first, the first trend that I suggested about it's an age of faith, of course that is being driven by an understanding of this, of this spirit. The third factor, or the third trend that I see is we're living in a time of indigenous ministry. Now, I loved to go to missionary conferences when I was a kid because we'd have these missionaries come from exotic places and show all these wonderful snake skins they would unroll and whatever other artifacts. And it was, it was wonderful stuff, but they were all white guys. No, there were some white women then too. In fact, for us, it was the white women that really uh, blazed the trails. But today that has changed. Post-colonialism pushed it. But in some places, there was an understanding, and it, it started with some, some Brits back in the 18th century who thought about the three self, self-propagating, self-funding, and self-governing. And so in Korea, in the early days, that became a mantra. And of course, when the Kuomintang fell in 49, and the Chinese government said it's got to be three self, it was a wonderful opportunity. It was a, it, was a, it was a gift of the communist government to the church to press in on its church self-governance. And so wherever you go where the church is growing, it's led by indigenous people. And, and there's not a, a great leap of logic for that. If you have someone who speaks the language and who understands the culture, uh, who knows the ways of the spirit, uh, the, the people, is able to nuance the, the theology into the lives and the culture of the people, it makes all the sense in the world. Now, this in no way diminishes the role of the missionary enterprise of moving cr across culturally. It just means that our role is different. I was uh, at a meeting with David in South Korea. Uh, was that 2.13? And uh, I was, uh, there was a number of Chinese pastors who were denied an exit visa to go to the 210 Cape Town Lausanne Congress. They had come to this meeting. So there was all kinds of things going on. And I was sitting one day having lunch with about four or five pastors. And they were asking us how many Chinese, there's, a, there's an internal thing with the, with the, uh, the registered and the unregistered churches in China. And, and, and David could take you 10 hours and explain the sim some simplicity of this complex problem yeah. to you. Uh, and so they were asking me at the World Evangelical Alliance, which was coming up in the next, in the next year or so, how many Chinese pastors would be invited from China to go there. And David, I was... I just wasn't very bright that day, but I said, well, I'm not sure how much money we'll be able to raise to pay for, you know, the, 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 the costs. And a pastor looked at me across the table and he laughed at me. And that laugh, it told me that I really had missed a point. I said, what's funny? Well, he said, when we were denied the ability to go, we raised a million dollars to help people from other countries who couldn't go. He said, the last thing we need is your money. Why? Because indigenous leadership had built through the years a very strong church. The fourth. There is a re-engagement in the public square. There's a whole, back in the early part of the 20th century, latter part of the 19th, evangelicals withdrew from the public square because of a, of, a, of a controversy. David Moberg in his book, The Great Reversal, describes it. There is, a, there is a conservative reaction to a liberal trend in theology. 
And so the liberal mainline church became the, the holders of, of public leadership, while, ev while evangelicals are sometimes called fundamentalists, we reacted and we did what God really wanted us to do, and that's get people saved and ready for eternity and not worry about the world. And there was a kind of a social consensus that these guys could run the world while we did the real work of the church. But we got to the 80s and 70s and 80s, and we realized what a mistake that, that was, that when salt and light is not present, when those who are managing drift away from the faith, Faith is not understood as being essential to the quality of life of that nation. It happened in North America. It happened in Europe. Finally, we woke up. But also, we realized our mistake. And the mistake was this, that the public square, civic engagement, is part of God's concern. And so when he uses the word salt and light as those very powerful metaphors, we understood how, we understand how salt and light indeed works. And for it to work, we need to be there. Now, around the world, this re-engagement in, pu in public square activities and leadership and, and civic leadership, it comes with a price. Uh, Paul Feston, in some of his books, has showed, in both in Africa and Latin America, sometimes the tragedies and how, how pastors will politicize their church by leading in politics and bringing their people with them, and that creates its own problem. But there is a re-engagement where evangelicals those who would be more conservative theologically realize that that is our calling, is, is to be engaged. When Jesus said, occupy till I come, he didn't really mean build spiritual fallout shelters till I come. And we've come to learn that. The fifth trend is an understanding of the holism of the gospel. The importance of concern for social justice. Now again, in the early part of the 20th century with the liberal conservative divide. We saw ourselves as working to get people saved because we were sinful in need of salvation. The social gospeler said, well, the real problem with humanity is that social constructs are evil and need to be redeemed. And if you redeem the social construct, then it doesn't impinge its sinful influence on individuals and people are freed freed up then to be good. Well, we rejected that as a theological construct and said the only construct is individuals. Well, the fact is both are right. That a negative, sinful social construct brings sinful pressure against individuals. I mean, just ask about pornography. Doesn't that say something about how right they got it? But they missed the personal aspect. What we have realized in the last few years is the importance of the holism of the gospel. Now, evangelicals, we, at the start, we've been involved in caring for people in need. And so justice, as it relates to the individual need, has been very much at the top of our interest. So in 1948, World Vision forms out of Youth for Christ. It formed and was funded by people, the largest humanitarian organization in the world today, funded by evangelicals who believe that we need to help people in need. We've always had a heart for that. But what we haven't done, we haven't connected the dots between the individual need for justice and those things that cause injustice, the systemic factors that cause injustice. So we would deal with, in a, in a sense, to use the plant metaphor, we would deal with the blooms of injustice, but we never did dealt with the stem of injustice. But today there is a, a globally, and especially with the younger generation, there is a concern and an interest in matters of injustice because we realize when the Bible says God loves injustice, or God loves justice, we should love justice too. So those are five basic drivers. Faith is on the rise. It's an age of the spirit. The indigenization of leadership. Re-engagement in the public square. Concern for the whole person. And those are drivers that are shaping this witness of the gospel worldwide. Now I asked you, I asked you at the beginning, what is... Where's the nudge of the Spirit to you? What, what, what do you feel? Now, Peter just didn't get a little nudge. He got, he got a real elbow in his ribs with that, with that vision let down out of heaven and 
the Lord says, rise, kill and eat. And Peter says, yeah, I'm kosher. I'm a good kosher boy. I don't, I don't do that stuff. And the word of the Lord is what I've created. Don't you dare call unclean. So that was, a, that was a, more than a nudge. But as you go, as you think about the, this very brief description of, of five sectors or five drivers within the church, where's the nudge? When I was invited to take this position four and a half years ago, there was, it had never been in, in the organization, so I had to kind of make it up as I went along. And it was in this early summer. It was during the time of the, of the, the rise of the, the hunger crises, the famine in the, in the Horn of Africa. And as I was listening and watching, I just felt this urge to do something and to go. And so I said to my wife, honey, you know, maybe I should go. And she said, what would you do? And I said, I have no idea. Well, she said, what would you accomplish? And I said, I have, I have no idea. But this kept growing and growing, and I, I finally called Dave Toyson, president of World Vision in Canada, uh, and he and I had been part of this conversation of me taking on the role, so he, he kind of had a new in my heart, he knew where my heart was. And I said, David, here's what I've been thinking. Do you think I should go? And he said, absolutely. He said, the famine is growing out of all proportion. He said, for you to represent the World Evangelical Alliance there on the ground would be an encouragement to our workers. It would help to the, the, the media, focus the media attention, and, and get people to support he said, first, and he said, also, we'll look after you. We'll take you to the various, various uh, refugee camps. So I flew to Nairobi, and I got there, and all the plans fell through uh, for, for, for reasons uh, that I still don't understand. And so I said to the, our director of the alliance in, in Africa, I said, what do we do, eh? He said, uh, I said, what about Mogadishu? I said, I, I see that the, uh, the Al-Shabaab has been pushed out of Mogadishu in Somalia by the African Union Army. And I knew a, a New World Vision had been pushed out of there about six months before, and they were feeding half a million kids a day. I said, maybe we could go back and negotiate getting back into Mogadishu. He said, you can't go to Mogadishu. It's too dangerous. I said, well, has anyone been there? He said, you can't go there. It's too dangerous. I said, well, why don't we see if we can get a flight? And he asked his agent, and the agent said, there's no flight. And so I got a computer, and I found an uh, African airplane going from Nairobi to Dubai the next day and dropping off some equipment in Mogadishu, and they had two seats, and so I bought it. I said, Aya, we're going to Mogadishu tomorrow. We went down to the uh, Somalian embassy to get our visas, and Mohammed could not figure out why we wanted to go to Mogadishu. And, and I tried to explain to him, and he didn't understand, and, and frankly, I didn't either. But we got our visas. We arrived in Mogadishu the next day. And I got to tell you, when there's two white guys in an African airport, it's amazing how you find each other. <laughs> this guy was a photojournalist from France. And so then he said, what are, like, who are you? What are you doing? So I told him. And he said, what, why are you here? And I, I kind of mumbled, mumbled my reconnaissance story. And he wasn't quite sure what that meant. And, and, and then he said, well, who's looking after you? And I said, Oh, well, 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 well we, we, we haven't got that far yet. And he, he used some expletives. I, I'll, they're adjectives, very colorful adjectives, but I'll drop them off my conversation here. He said, you're an idiot. <laughs> he said, this is the most dangerous place in the world and the most dangerous city, and don't leave this terminal. Well, the immigration officer agreed with him in time. He said, you sit there and wait. And so A and I sat there and waited and for about an hour, and then finally this man came in, his name was Amir. And the, the officer said, okay, you follow him. He'll look after me. We walked outside, and there was a truck with uh, five soldiers with AK-47s, an aide de camp, and a driver. Uh, Amir was a warlord, a good warlord at this point. He had an army of 100, and he had a hotel downtown next to the government buildings that was protected by his army. And so for all the time we were there, that was our bubble. We moved around to the various refugee camps. And then one afternoon, many ministers had come back as expats to Somalia to try and rebuild the government. And they, the government building was right next to Amir's hotel. And so they would come over in late afternoon waiting for sundown because it was Ramadan and they were waiting for the sun to go down to eat. And they would sit out in the courtyard protected by this army so Al-Shabaab couldn't get near and Amir loved to introduce me to anybody he could. This is crazy Brian from Canada. <laughs> Finally, one minister spoke up and said, why are you here? He said, 
Canadians are all cowards. Well, I said, uh, you got to ask the Boston Bruins that. <laughs> no, no. no. Uh, <laughs> I said, why? Well, he said, you all go to Nairobi. Nobody comes to Mogadishu. You're the first, first Canadian I've seen here in years. Why are you here? And so I just told him about my story of, of Christ. And I said, you know what the world thinks of Somalia and Somalians? You hijack on the high sea. You mutilate your girls sexually. You cut off the hands of robbers. You guys have got a bad reputation. But I'm here to tell you that God loves Somalia and God loves Somalians. Well, you know, I, I, I started preaching when I was 18. And I've preached about the love of God all my life. It's been my favorite theme. But in that moment, in that courtyard with those Muslim men, it was as if something, a breath came through that courtyard. And in that one moment, we were brothers. It was an incredible moment. A number of other things happened, but I'll just finish with this. As I was leaving, going through the security, there was this young Somalian standing doing the security. And I looked, and he was wearing a sweater with an English saying, and I thought, man, the kid doesn't speak English because he would never dare wear that here. So I tested him, and I said, what's true? Because the sweater said, this is true. Underneath was John 3.16. I said, what's true? And in beautiful English, he told me of coming to Christ. Now there's people waiting to get in through the security and kind of mumbling about who's this dumb white guy up there holding up the works. And he told me about his faith and so I had, a, I had just those moments to encourage him. Went on and left and came home and of course I'm back with my family and my big brother. I'm the youngest of three and we all suffer this with bigger brothers. He said, okay, kid brother, what, what did you accomplish? I said, I have absolutely no idea. And my wife who for 52 years has been a constant source of wisdom, said, oh, I think I know what it was. I said, what was it? She said, you're just starting this role. Now remember, I'm 70 years of age at that point, so you'd think I'd learned a few things. She said, I think the Lord was testing you as to whether you felt his nudge. Ah. Now, a nudge doesn't mean you do a crazy thing like going to Somalia, which was a dumb thing to do. But it was a very important thing for my life experience. You see, learning to respond to a nudge is like using a muscle. You use it or you lose it. As you learn to respond to the spirit nudging, as you respond yes, you become more skillful in feeling the nudge and learning what's an appropriate response. So my prayer for you today, as you go through this missions week, as you study through this year, feel the nudge. Take serious the nudge. Don't jump off the Brooklyn Bridge. It might be the wrong nudge. You gotta test the nudge. But the Spirit will lead you. He knows you. He loves your future more than you do. And he will give you the nudge because he has caused a place for you in the grand enterprise as he had for Peter and Cornelius. We give thanks through Christ. Amen.